So how do one, does one engage a, a teenage mind in literature? That's the big question, I think. Because teenage years are very stormy for parents and for teachers. The job of having to steer a teenager through this period that's absolutely marked by turbulent changes and trying to help them blossom and mature and importantly invest in an education. This isn't an easy task at all. There is a cognitive neuroscientist called Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore and her research has found her research into the prefrontal cortex uh, that part of the brain that's responsible for decision making, for memory, for empathy, for judgment making. All of that is still developing in a teenage mind. So it's all still in flux. The brain is still very malleable as ideas can be opened in a way that they're not when you become uh, further on into adulthood. And for a teacher, this research really is a valuable aid for us who are tasked with not only the academic progress of the students in our care, but also their social um, well-being as, uh, as well. And um, because for the student at that moment, an adolescent, their self-concept, their self-knowledge, their sense of themselves, their experiences in the world around them are all in a state of flux. And they have, they're trying to reevaluate, reformulate their own, their very own identities. But it's also, luckily for us teachers, it's a time when they have an ability to empathise and this idea of empathy really kicks in in teenage years. And so they are able to hear a contrary point of view and hold it alongside their own point of view. They're able to imagine thoughts and experiences and feelings of others and really to be able to sort of stand in someone else's shoes and really try to imagine what's going on in the other, in the other person's mind. And in cognitive neuroscientific circles, this is known as theory of mind or mind reading. And it really has great applications in the study of literary texts. Because it seems to be that our brains make no distinction between our relationships in the three-dimensional world and the emotions that we invest in characters in a literary context. But what enables our cognitive architecture to really make sense of and respond to these entities which are composed entirely of syntax, these characters? Because all literary characters exist only as black smudges on a white page. But as readers, we become sort of emotionally connected to these ink and paper individuals. And there is Professor Paul Hanardi argues that literary experience for us, as well as for our teenagers, it's not triggered in a vacuum. As readers, we process events and characters in an imagined space as if they were corresponding to an actual event or an actual situation in the three-dimensional world. And for teenagers, at this moment in their lives, they're first developing this ability to accurately infer the intentions and emotions of other people. And for literature teachers, teachers like myself, studies in this cognitive literary criticism, it really enables us to see new critical approaches, new ways of seeing texts, and we can build upon our tried and tested methods of asking students what they think of a text. So I'd like to give you an example of mind reading in action, and um, it comes from a class of Toisiem that I had three years ago at CFBL. I can see a number of them in the audience tonight. And I had prepared these extracts of James Joyce's Ulysses. And there was Stephen Daedalus's um, entrance on Sandy Mount Strand. There was Leopold Bloom's entrance into the novel. And there was Molly Bloom's famous eight-sentence soliloquy that finishes Ulysses. And Ulysses, as you probably well know, it's supposed to be one of the most difficult novels in the canon to decode and critique. And it's a text that's left a trail of confused readers in its wake. And the extracts that I'd chosen, they were very well-known extracts, very well studied and very well argued over pieces. There are thousands of literature students the world over who must have dedicated thousands of hours to the study of this really complex text. So there is this vast body of criticism which exists. So I could help the students if I needed to, to guide them through the text with the critics that have gone before them. But I didn't want to do that. I, want, I didn't want to just impart critics' knowledge and say, go away and learn what the critic has said about James Joyce's Ulysses. What I wanted them to do was to really put their collective heads together and offer their opinion on what they thought Joyce's words were all about. And I just have to tell you a word about these students before I continue. 
These were students, exceptional students in my um, TOSIEM class. They were 14 and 15 year olds who had for the last two years gone on this journey of literature. They had William Blake at 13, a modernist taster at 14, and I, as a teacher, I'd been truly amazed at what they could see under the surface of the text. I could do Shakespeare, I could do Sylvia Plath, T.S. Eliot. There didn't seem to be an artist, because I tried many, there didn't seem to be an artist that they wouldn't try on, so they just went with all this literature. And I used to say to them, when embarking on a new piece of literature, trust yourselves as critics of literature. It was my well-worn mantra, which I'm sure they all <laughs> remember me say. And I used to say it to them every time we put on our critical glasses and started to look down at a text. Trust yourselves as a critic of literature. And I said to them, you won't find meaning straight away. You won't get it by yourselves. But if we put our collective heads together, you'll find that the sum of our combined observations will be a deeper, richer, more nuanced, and we could say more accurate interpretation of the text. And as long as you remember, I used to tell them, that writers occupy the same space as you in the three-dimensional world, so they feel the same joys and triumphs, the same exasperations and disappointments, I said, you will get it, and, and they did. As I told them, a good writer, a great writer, a, great, a writer worth his or her semantic salt will really try to get to the knotty and intricate heart of the human experience, which is what literature is all about. Uh, the difference between the writer and the student is the writer's left behind a record of those experiences in beautifully crafted English. But the student can and does, it, it, the student is able to follow these clues that the writer has left through the text and it will lead them to, a, the, to have a deeper understanding of humanity's frailties and sufferings, its resilience and capacity for empathy. My college students are just like us teachers of literature, able to recognise these artists' concerns that lie beneath their constructions. And my students can do this because they felt themselves part of the world and they felt themselves um, bumping up against and interacting with other people in that world with them. I hope that I'm able to facilitate this process of recognition, not by imposing my own thoughts on the text or leading them on some kind of analytical goose chase until they come up with the answer that I think is the correct one. I hope that I'm able to just try to guide their critical ideas to one textually evidenced interpretation or another. I can give them the tools they need to tackle a text. I can share my passion for literature. I can show them how to input literary devices, comparative and contextual references into a text. And like a maths equation, puzzle out meaning. I can show them how to shape and polish their thoughts, craft their ideas into beautifully constructed essays that adhere to a methodology. And sharing the tools of the trade, because after all I've been trained as a teacher, so sharing the tools of my trade, imparting my technical knowledge, is what I bring to the learning process. But I don't have all the answers for the right interpretation. And I really feel as a teacher that it's critical that my students understand that there is a space in this discussion for their ideas and their responses, because their experiences of the world matter. Their place and time matter in the here and now. For example, who can read The Merchant of Venice without addressing the Holocaust? Who can read To Kill a Mockingbird and not think of this disturbing rise of the far-right narrative that's going across European politics? Who can read The Great Gatsby without drawing parallels to the global crash of 2007? So my students, I feel, come to a text with their own experiences of life and the living and the solving of it. Their, their interpretations can and do change and evolve according to the shifting tints and textures of their continuing individual and collective narratives. I have a responsibility and a duty to listen carefully to what my students have to say, to acknowledge and validate what they see in a text. I can study the same book across the years and across classes, and every single time, every single time, there will be a student who has some different interpretation that I'd never, it never occurred to me before. And it might only be a way of seeing a sentence. It might only be a single word, but it doesn't matter. 
is the fact is that I've learned something new in whatever text we, we've got under our critical lenses. And I think here, right there, is the nature of transactional teaching. It's really letting the students have this, this space uh, in, in a discussion to engage their theory of mind, to see something new in a text that comes wholly from the student's empathetic part of their brain. And it's a scary thing for any of us to offer up our thoughts, to be picked over and scrutinised and evaluated by a group of individuals. But as long as a student's ideas are held by everybody in that group, they will gain a confidence to speak out, knowing that they won't be laughed at, they won't be told that they're wrong. And even if they have no recall across the terms or down the years of the idea that they threw out that one day in an English lesson, they will sense or remember that their thoughts were endorsed and authenticated this is the path I truly believe as a teacher. This is the path that will lead them to their own independent critical thinking, but also to be em empathetic individuals in their social world, interacting with their peers and adults alike. So for me, the business of literary criticism really gets going properly when my students are in quatrième, and almost to a student, they are baffled by the mechanics of literary criticism. They say things like, how can we know for sure that the writer meant to make our critical radars beep with that particular literary device? How can we be sure that William Blake meant to echo a smithy's hammer with his regular and rhythmic meter in the tiger? How can the burnt out ends of smoky days possibly speak of the nullifying modernist condition? They'll say, it's too far-fetched, Miss Welby, they'll say. But seeing meaning in a text, it really is baffling at the beginning. But to our shared experience, my experience, the students' experience, they are shared experience together. These students will see that there is the idea of love or passion that they had when they, when they looked at the image of a red rose. It's actually shared by other people in the group as well. And if someone else thought that, then maybe there's some merit or veracity in their own ideas. So little by little across the years, my quatrièmes begin to find their critical feet. We always take regular compass points along the way, and I always encourage them to see how far they've come by themselves in, this, uh, in their analytical and semantic landscapes. And what seemed to them at the beginning of quatrième to be this analytical alchemy, it actually turns out to be a culmination of experience, effort, practice, but most of all, trusting their theory of mind skills to be critics of their own. So by Twesium, they were decoding complex texts, almost standing on their heads. And for me as a teacher, it was really a privilege to have accompanied these young minds on that analytical journey and to try to bring them to texts where they were able to see, really see, the complexities of the human condition in typeface. And by Twesium, they are able to recognise the universalities that run through a particular time and location that the writer has chosen to set his or her text. Because they too have felt, or will feel at some moment in their lives, these emotions, these concerns and these questions too. There is a, um, two years ago I studied the History Boys with my Twesium group, an Alan Bennett play. And he has, Alan Bennett has a moment where there is an old teacher coming to the end of his career and he says something to a student and it's almost theory of mind as a definition. And so there's a, a group of eager young teenagers who are going off to carve their mark on the doors of, of Oxford colleges. And the teacher at the end of his career says to one of them, the best moments in reading are where you come across something, a thought, a feeling, a way of looking at things, which you had thought was special and particular to you. And now, here it is, set down by someone else, a person that you have never met, someone even who is long dead, and as if it's a hand, has come out across time and taken yours. My Twesium students who tackled extracts of Ulysses at 14 and 15 years old, they'd had some really challenging texts across the two years. And they'd not only risen to these challenges, they'd actually soared, absolutely soared on every single occasion. And it was, so it was with Joyce that afternoon. During the course of their analysis, the trope of motherhood, 
gender identities, national identities, multiple perspectives, the weight of Irish history, the modernist condition, the symbols of sea and time, perspectives on life, love and death, they all came flying towards my whiteboard. And it was from the students themselves, these clever, thoughtful, mindful students, that, this, and that they decoded uh, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. I, told them not to, I didn't tell them that Joyce was scary. I didn't tell them that Joyce was unfathomable. So they weren't scared, and they fathomed him out. And it was really, they weren't scared of their, he, Joyce's words, and they weren't scared of themselves as, as critics of literature. And it was really, I could see, with their developing theory of mind skills, they, they'd been in training over the previous two years, and I could see it whirring and flashing, and they found meaning in James Joyce in a sniff. And for me, it was just an amazing moment as a teacher. So like everything in life worth having, being a good critic of literature takes time and practice, experience and hard work. But underpinning all of this, is a confidence that one is able to find meaning in a text using the skill of inference and the skill of empathy. My job, I feel, as a teacher in the first instance is to instill a confidence in my students of their very own critical abilities. If this, this keystone isn't in place, then the whole analysis will be shaky and, and uncertain because they will always be looking to me to tell them the right answer. And that won't do at all not least in the exams that they'll have to take at the end of, of uh, Terminal. But I do feel that in the second instance, encouraging their empathetic abilities, strengthening their aptitude for decoding fictive situations and characters' intentions will enhance their sense of selfhood, their sense of themselves, and their sense of themselves within a community as they navigate relationships in real life spaces. Because the literary text, it seems, it does more than just give us pleasure, take us by surprise, and delight us with its elegant technical constructions. It can, and does, enable us to decode, make sense of, and understand our fellow mammals' um, ideas, intentions, feelings, thoughts, emotions. And it's important that they do understand this as we're bumping up it together in our communities. So I do feel, really as a teacher, by encouraging our students to take their minds through a, for a healthy run through the myriad of literature that's on offer, we are in effect training our teenagers for the main sprint in the social arena of the three-dimensional world, hoping desperately that they'll run the right way, stay on the right track, and above all, empathize with their fellow runners. Thanks very much.